Hello folks and welcome to the channel, oh, welcome back and this is going to be another continuation of working on the tower room where we have started to install plasterboard walls and some other walls we have restored and I already have finished some of those walls and I just want to show you that how I've done that and also going to show you how I am applying a finish onto the plasterboard and how we sanding down the joint filler and how we apply the joint finisher. And of course, I'm going to answer, first of all, quite some questions because you all have posed a whole bunch of questions to me. Now, one of the questions was, why am I always wearing a cap? Well, the reason for that is, I don't want to get my hair dirty. No, I'm just kidding. I almost lost all my hair. So, no, the real reason is, I wear a cap quite often because I don't want to get the dirt on top of my skull. I want to keep my brains warm because I'm going to need them for another 20 years, maybe, if I'm lucky. Anyhow. Just kidding. Um, so we're going to be answering the questions about the glazing, uh, why I haven't done the glazing. We're going to be answering the questions about why I'm placing a drywall in front of another wall, why I'm not using lime, and also a question about why I am not restoring things uh, with original materials, or why don't I restore things as they were like they would have been at the time, with some assumptions. So we're going to be answering all these questions first, and then I'm going to do some more sanding and we're going to do some more plastering. So, with any further ado, let's go. So the first question I had was, why did I not finish the glazing? Um, I have the wings uh, downstairs and uh, they are ready to put the glazing in. But the reason I haven't put the glazing in is that I just couldn't get the glass in time. I have ordered double glazed glass with a special insulation factor on it and they will go into the wings. but. It was building uh, leaf, so a summer break for the building industry, uh, and then that takes about three, four weeks, and then we have COVID, so that's the reason why. Uh, I was told that I will get the parts in about two, three weeks, so I'm expecting the glazing to be here uh, very soon, so then you will see the video once we, are, once we are putting the glazing into the wings and all the way on the top of the window frame. So that is coming, so, um, I guess we have to be a bit patient for that. Now some of the comments that I have received was that why I'm placing a drywall in front of the original walls. Now this is the original wall and I kept that original because that was in a good condition and I could still see what was there before. So I kept what I could see at the time so I did not reinvent new things. So I have refinished this wall. I didn't took off all the old line because it was in a very good condition. I did the knock test and I kept it as it is and then I sanded it down and then I have placed a new coat of very thin uh, joint finisher on that. And now I'm having a fairly smooth uh, wall. It still needs to be sanded, but this is now kind of ready in terms of plastering. Um, let me show you what I've done on the top, just to give you a bit of a better idea. And then we have a closer look on the chimney. I have retained the old chimney and the wall around it and also kept the profile on top. So I kind of restored that profile because that was still intact and I didn't want to fake anything, but because it was intact, I just fixed the bad parts on it. And you can see how that nicely ties in with the oak beams. Now I still have some tape around it, but let me give you a little bit of a close up on how that looks like. And here you have the close up where the beams are actually fitted into the chimney and you can see they have the tape still there for the plaster. So now we're going to sand this and then prime this and then we're going to paint it. So when you do the renovation of an old building, you don't want to pretend that certain things were there if they are no longer there. We can all have an idea on how it might have been, but we are never sure. So that's why I will never create something uh, to, that pretends that it was there. In other words, if I have old beams and I'm missing a beam, I am not going to put in another beam which is looking old. I'm not going to make that new beam looking old. I'm just going to leave it as is. So I just installed a new oak beam. You can see that it's a new one. It's still oak. It strengthened the structure of the ceiling but it doesn't create homogeneity. Well, it does in terms of material, but not in terms of look. But do I care? No, I don't care because I don't mind that people see that this is a new beam. I'm only gonna keep these walls that are still having their original character. I will fix them where I have to fix them in terms of 
making them more stronger, I mean, cleaning them up in a proper way without losing all the details and so on, that's something I will do. Uh, for instance, this chimney, and I'm going to show that to you in a second, and you'll see how crooked this chimney is. I did not straighten it up. Why should I? Because it was built crooked. If you take a close look on this chimney, you will see that this side, the shape is a bit different than that side. This side is curving in far more than that side. So the question really is now, is this something you want to correct or not? And in my opinion, you don't want to correct this. This is how it was built and that's how I want to keep it. Yes, it is not straight, but so what? It, it, that's how it was. So I'm trying to keep always these original conditions and shapes as much as I can. So this is the other wall where I have placed drywall and this is now covering up the old wall. Now, the old wall was in such a bad shape, it was kind of replastered in 1920, so I don't even know what the original style was. It was a mixture of it and there was a lot of bad, real bad spots in it, uh, of loose plaster or loose lime. So I decided to, well, you know, let's put up a new drywall for this. Um, I don't mind that people see that this is a very straight and level wall, that it's different than the chimney wall. So people will see, oh, the chimney and the chimney wall, those are original with the curvature on the top, you know, the, the profiling on the top. Here, the profiling was gone. I, I, I couldn't uh, recreate that profiling because I don't really know how it was. It may have been similar to what I have on the chimney, but I'm not sure, so I'm not going to do it. So that's why I went straight up to the ceiling. No curvature on that. So this is how I do this. Another example is this door. And so when I got here, um, there was nothing left. There was no more door. And I decided to rebuild the door. I didn't know how it looked like. I could have guessed how it looked like. I could have looked it up in magazines or documentation, but I didn't. Uh, I just built an ordinary straightforward oak door. And everybody can tell that this is not an original door. Yet I have some parts on it, ornaments or artifacts that were original because they were laying on the floor on an old piece of wood behind that door. So I placed them on here, but you can actually see that they are not uh, on the original door and that's a bit the concept I'm always trying to use. Now the ornaments we kept and I placed them back and the wall was restored and in the sense that I left the bricks where they were and I grinded out the back joints uh, because there were quite some bad joints and then I filled them back up with the proper filling material. So this was a restoration but I didn't do nothing that wasn't there before. So this staircase is another artifact and I'm going to restore this one in the sense that I'm going to repair all the parts that are missing. I took it already apart and I'm going to put all new pens in, that's for sure. Uh, and I will put it back together. Now the steps are missing, I'm missing some steps. So for those I'm going to use new oak planks. Uh, and I will create those planks. So you will see that these planks are new, whereby the baluster that we have here going up is, is the original part. What is going to be the restoration effort on the staircase, on the baluster? Well, it's removing all the pins that are holding it together. There are no nails in this, it's all based with wooden pins. I already placed one in here. That one is the missing one, so that has to go in. So this is how I'm going to keep it together. I'm going to do it the same way. So yes, I'm rebuilding or recreating those pins, but that's exactly what was in there before. So I took them out, I drilled them out already in these areas because they were actually eaten by woodworm. Now to get into the tower room, the staircase is really missing. So I'm not going to create the same pillars and the same baluster as we see downstairs. I'm not going to copy it. I'm going to install a steel staircase there. Very modern, so people see the difference. This is one of the original doors that I found in this building once I started renovating it and I just took it off. I have actually repaired it in some areas and you can actually see that. I still have to get some of the glue off, but I used old wood to repair it in this case. And now you're going to say, well, Steve, you're not very consistent. But the wood I used uh, was from the similar door that actually was sitting in the same room, but was totally gone. So I recovered some of that wood to fix this door up. Now on this door, I'm not going to put a new lock on. This is the original lock and, and that must be very old because you can see it on the nails. We call them Christ nails. You know, they are kind of nails that are forged in a uh, blacksmith fire. And I'm going to keep this, you know, this is kind of a lock. I will keep that. Now this lock was added later. You can actually tell that. Uh, but I'm going to keep that as well. So you kind of see the 
generation difference onto the same door and that's all part of preserving things. Uh, I could remove this, right? And then just pretend this was the only one. Well, I didn't because it's there. So I don't want to remove things that give you an idea about how things evolved. Pretty interesting this one. It has even the label on it, who built it. Let me show you that. So whoever created the lock must have been very proud because they got their, their initials on it, JDF. This chimney was certainly built in the stucco period and you can see that actually on this profile that you have up here. That's what people used to do. They were very fancy of these plaster profiles in that period. Uh, but as you can see, um, we have still some missing parts here and let me get you a bit of a close-up so I can show you what I mean with that and how I'm going to restore this. So this chimney is kind of incomplete and around it you have these cupboards uh, where people could put in their food. It's a bit weird that you would put your food next to a fireplace. I, I never understood that very well, but maybe they had a reason for that. Uh, maybe it was so cold in the winter in the houses that they wanted to keep their liquids uh, close to the fireplace. I don't know. But as you can see, we are missing some um, elements on the bottom here, and I'm certainly missing an element here. I don't know how this has looked like and I didn't even bother to uh, trying to rebuild something by faking a stove or something else and uh, an, an armature in front of it because I just don't know. So I'm going to keep it as is and maybe one day people can tell me what this must have been. It certainly has been a fireplace because you can see the bricks here are really damaged from fire. But how that all worked, who knows? I don't even know what was in front of it. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep it like this. I'm going to clean up these doors a bit. Not too much, just a little bit. I don't want to take the uh, texture off that. And I'm going to clean up the bricks a little bit and then that should be it. And this is really my favorite. This is a big fireplace. And as you can see the sides, uh, I'm going to keep them as they are, pure brick. I know they must have been covered before with some plaster or lime, because you can see it on this side, it's more smooth. In other areas it's gone, totally gone. But I'm not going to replaster this. I'm going to keep this as is so you can see the wear and tear. And even in the back, I'm going to keep things as they are. I have to admit, I have repointed the back uh, of these bricks because they were all loose, so I kept them in place. And of course, I have uh, reworked a bit the floor because we had tiles here and I filled in the bad tiles with old tiles that I still had laying around here from this fireplace. So all by all, not much has changed on this fireplace ever since that was created. So I think I talked enough about all these ways on how I'm preserving stuff. So now let's get back upstairs and start doing some more plaster work because that's what we wanted to do in this video. So when we were installing the drywall, we installed this maze on the joining areas between the plaster boards. And then we used some self-made plaster or joint filler to fill up that area. Uh, and then we let it dry, we sanded it, and then we applied a second coat onto that. And if necessary, you may have to apply a third coat. Now it's all dried up and you can actually see it when it's turning white and has no more dark spots in it and you know it's dry. And now it's time to sand it. So we're gonna sand it and then we're going to plaster the whole area with a joint finisher. So now it's time to start finishing up the wall. So first of all, we're going to sand it. And I'm using a 120 grit sanding paper to do that job. I'm using a sander. I find it ha uh, very handy. And it's a adhesive, a bit like Velcroach when you stick it to the sander, very handy. But you can do it by hand. It doesn't really matter as long as you do it even uh, and smooth. So you don't need to grind it too deep down, you just want to get the uneven parts of the wall and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Once you've done that, you've got to make sure that you take the dust off the wall. Uh, doing that you can do it with a cloth or you can use a vacuum cleaner. The good thing about these sanding papers is that there are little holes inside and you can attach it to your vacuum cleaner, your sander, so it sucks itself to the wall actually, so you don't have to hold it against it, the whole thing actually holds itself against it. Let me show you that in a few seconds. So I, I always found that a very handy way to do it. Uh, 
and then you're going to need a couple of tools. You're going to have to have a very smooth knife. This is the knife to apply, actually, um, the coat onto the wall. Now, these knives that are much longer, you can use those as well. I am not using the very long ones. I like this handy short one. Some people bend over the corners a bit in one direction on both sides, so then you have no lines or, uh, or uneven areas on the wall. Uh, but then, of course, you've got to be careful that you don't flip it around because then you're going to scratch the wall. Uh, I don't do this. Um, you can because that stuff we're going to apply is very soft. And after I have applied it, I'm going to sand the wall again. All right. So once you've done that, then you're ready to apply the uh, joint finisher or the finisher overall. Now, I'm going for a smooth finisher and I'm using a pre-made one. Now, I know this is contrary to what I said before. Uh, because I typically like to make my own products, at least for the joint filler. But for the joint finisher, I like to buy a pre-made product because uh, if you mix it yourself, I always ending up with small pieces in it and, and then it makes it difficult uh, to make a very smooth finish. So uh, you need to clean the top very well because you can't have any small particles that are not dissolved or mixed properly. So that's where I like a pre-mix. It's a bit more expensive, but I think it's a much better finish. And then when, when that is all done, then we're going to let it dry. And this wall is actually done. And then we're going to sand it. And I'm going to show you more details on this wall in a few uh, seconds or minutes on how that looks like to finish it all up. And again, finishing it all up, I'm going to use a grid 120. When everything is applied, the final thing is a grid 120. I know some people use a, a 220 or a 150. I like a 120. It's not too corrosive, not too fine. And I still like to have a little bit of roughness for the paint to attach to it. So let's start cleaning up, first of all now, the joint filler that we applied for the second time. So if you're going to do renovation work, uh, tools are everything. I know I may sound like an old fart. In fact, I am an old fart. But it's not a joke. Uh, if you have the right tools, the job becomes so much easier. It may cost you a bit of money, but it's certainly worthwhile investing in it. What I have here is a vacuum cleaner, and they come in all kinds of types. But the good thing about this vacuum cleaner is that I can attach it to my sander. And if I start my sander, my vacuum cleaner will start. And if I stop my sander, then the vacuum cleaner stops. So this is pretty handy and it's attached to the back. And because it's attached, it's sucking air through these little holes here in the foot of the sander and it sticks it to the wall. So if you sand you know, on the wall, it just holds it by itself. So you don't really need to push or anything. It, it's just very handy. And the foot itself is kind of a Velcroach and I'm using this paper. So all you need to do is then stick that on there and then off you go when you start sanding. So let's stick it on, make sure the holes line up. And now we are ready to go. So here we have the joint filler and it's a bit uneven. I don't know if you can see it, but you can see all these little ridges and edges. And I'm gonna smoothen that up uh, with the sander. You don't need to force that very hard. Um, here we go, I'm just gonna turn that off. So what you really want to do is to take the unevenness out of it and you can feel it with your hands afterwards. Um, you don't need to sand very deep and if you feel that you still have a ditch or an uneven area, you can still fill it up with some additional joint uh, filler. If it's just a little bit, don't worry about it, then you're going to fill it up with your joint finisher. So I'm going to continue sanding the rest of this wall and then we apply the um, finisher. Remember what I said that you can actually uh, leave it on there? And then as a last uh, check, I'm just going over it with my hands to feel if I have any unevenness. Your hands are your best tool to do this. 
Uh, so that's looking quite all right. And as you can see, there's very little dust uh, still on the walls here. There's a bit of it, but almost nothing, right? I've been rubbing this very hard along the whole surface and my hand is barely has any dust on it. And that's because the vacuum cleaner sucks it uh, into these little holes here. Now, one more thing, uh, the bigger the surface of the sander you have, the better it is. Don't go with a tiny little sander because then you're not gonna get a lot of evenness onto the wall. So with that now done, uh, I guess we are kind of ready to apply the actual finisher. So let's do that. So the way, the way I'm doing this, I'm getting some of that putty onto my knife. And then I'm just applying it, you know. You can see I have some parts in it because of my pop life. It's a little bit of pulling around this putty, but it's not that bad. And I'm gonna cover the whole wall, so not just one area, right? But I'm starting always up at the area where the joints are. Now this, you want to finish up nicely. Now I found out waving like this is a very good approach to do this. So we'll need quite a bit of that, but that's okay. And you might have seen that I have a few little hard particles in it sometimes. And that's just because I used the pot before and some particles must have fallen in that became more hard. But as you can see, this is going very smoothly. And this is how you do it. Now that was not a good move. Uh, that one is. And don't worry, if you have these little lines, they will be rubbed away the second time you're gonna sand this. So don't worry about that at all. So I'm going to continue doing this and then I'll show you the end result. Because this is always the same. I always try to go in different directions initially and then when I'm finishing it up, I'm trying to go in these arcs or waveforms. Huh? Now some people like to use a bigger knife to smoothen it all up. That's another option. I like the small one. That's entirely up to you, what you feel most comfortable with. So once it's dried up, you can actually sand it down for the last time. And it depends a bit of the type of finisher that you used. Um, abrasive paper of a grit 220 is typically always good, but you can go down to 150, uh, even a 120 if you want, uh, but then check it always out it doesn't, if it doesn't cause any scratches on it, because that would not be good. Anyhow, um, let's have a look on the part that already is dried up and how we're going to sand that. So this is already dried up and feels nice. So now you can sand this by hand if you want with a sanding block. And as you can see, I spotted here a, an area where we have this little unevenness uh, as a result of applying it to it. Uh, so we're going to sand it and I'm using a uh, grid 220 to do that. And you'll see how smoothly that goes. I'm gonna move the sander back and forth. I don't apply too much pressure. And at the end, you'll see we ending up with a nice finish. Always move back and forth, never stop at one specific place because then you're going to sand a ditch. Feel with your hand how smooth it is. And this 
this is the end result. It's uh, very smooth right now and all the unevenness is gone and that's exactly how you want to do it. So now we're going to continue the whole wall with this until we are finished. So this is the old wall and here we have a real uh, uneven area. I don't know what I've done here but it looked like something rubbed in it afterwards so I'm going to sand this the same way and you'll see how that will end up. So this cleaned up quite nicely, so I might rub it a little bit more, maybe I apply a little bit more and finish it on that to fill up the little ditches here or little holes, but that it all depends upon you on how smooth you want to have the finish. There were a couple of questions about electrical cabling. Why is the cabling not installed? Uh, where are the sockets? Um, and the reason for that is that the walls that I installed so far, which is the drywall and the, rep and the restoration of the original wall behind me, is that I'm not going to install sockets inside the wall. What I'm going to use is a plinth and imagine that this is the plinth. Of course, that is not the real plinth. I'm going to put the plinth along the ground level, along the wall, and then I'm going to have these pots which are actually electrical uh, contain, uh, pots to contain the, the sockets or the light switches and I'm going to put that inside and that way I can place them along uh, the wall wherever I want to. Now typically this is not going to work in a normal house because you have to have a certain height of that plinth. Now because these ceilings are so high here I can actually implement a fairly tall plinth. So I'm going to install that plinth probably around 15 to 16, 18 centimeters tall and then it's going to be fairly thick but in fact it's going to have a cavity in the back and that's where the cables will be running. That's also where I'm going to run the electrical uh, cabling for the light switches and all the um, power outlets. And besides that I will include as well the pipes for the heating system for the two radiators we can install uh, below the uh, window frames. So that is the reason why you didn't see it. Now obviously on one side I will have to have light switches uh, of course on the proper height. So there the, these pots actually will go inside the wall and you will actually see me installing electrical cables in that area. So hopefully that explained it. And you'll see me building these plinths, uh, how that will look like. And I've done this before and it looks pretty nice. But again, it has to fit in the building where you're working on. So the dimensions have to be right. So folks, we are nearing the end of this video and I have answered quite a couple of questions and maybe a little bit too much. Uh, but I wanted to give you that clarity. And you also have seen on how we actually, after two coats of joint filler, we sanded that joint filler down. Then we applied some pre-made um, joint finisher. We let it dry and then we sand it again with different types of abrasive paper. And this is how you're going to get a smooth surface. At the end, we will cover this with a sealant or a primer as we call it. And then we can actually paint it. Now the paint is going to be a bit weird. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. You'll see when I'm finished with the other wall because I still have to do one more wall on the other side. So in the coming videos, uh, we're going to work on this wall and there's still a bit of work to be done here. Now this specific wall, we're going to install again a drywall just like we did on the other side. Um, and then around the windows, uh, we need to work this whole area out. And we'll do that with the structure of uh, these uh, metal studs and some wood. And then we'll put some plywood up and then we're going to put some plasterboard up. So you see me doing all this in the coming videos. But that's not going to be the only thing we're going to be doing. Uh, there's going to be a video as well about the actual painting, the plinths, the electricity and also something very special about the lighting we're going to apply in here. We're going to build our own LED strips. So keep watching and I'll see you in my next video and thank you for viewing. Bye bye.